This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Sharp and welcome to this an aware profile. We're glad to have you there. On this show, we will talk one on one, up close and personal with a Holocaust survivor. 78 year old Alan J. Hall will share his compelling story of how he and his family survived one of the most atrocious genocides in human history. Historians even say between the 1930s and 40s, more than 11 million innocent people lost their lives, including an estimated 6 million Jews and over a million Jewish children. Now they say those numbers could be even higher. Now during this time, Holocaust victims were systematically persecuted, enslaved, starved, imprisoned, and even murdered. Loire is proud to present Mr. Hall, who says his family survived by going into hiding for years. And every day, just staying alive was a major feat. Well, today, Hall is a retired attorney and a professor emeritus, and he gives back to his community by sharing his childhood story riddled with horrors of everyday life of surviving the Holocaust. We thank you so much for being here on The Aware Show. Thank Mr. you for having Mr. me. Mr. Hall, we're glad to have you here. This, this, out of all of the years that I have done The Aware Show, this has got to be one of the most compelling stories that I've been able to bring to our program here. And compelling because we hear about the Holocaust, but you don't meet a Holocaust survivor every day. Tell us, what was it like growing up during this time in Poland? Um, I wasn't aware that I was growing up. I was simply hiding, trying to stay alive, minute by minute, hour by hour. So uh, it was only, always a matter of survival. And it was always just dealing with overwhelming fear. Um, that that's about the, all I can remember of that time. And we're talking about a four-year-old boy. It started when I was five, and and five to age of uh, ten. People can't fathom what it's like to live minute by minute, not knowing if that is the last minute, and this goes on for years. It was, I guess, within my family. We used to think of it in terms of defeating Hitler. This was the only way we could fight back, by just staying alive. And uh, whatever it took, whether it required uh, walking uh, without attracting attention to myself when I had a wound in my foot, never, limp, never having a chance to limp, whether it was going without food, whether it was staying by myself, and never seeing another child for for years, or um, uh, many other discomforts, I'm gonna call it. it was worse deprivations, but whatever it was, it was just a matter of always staying alive the next hour. And your family, you had a mother, a father, and a brother, and for your parents, staying alive was about you and your brother. Yes, my brother was born during the war, so at the beginning of the war. For my first five years were very comfortable. Uh, we, we lived a very nice middle class life. My father had an excellent job with an insurance company, he was an adjuster. My mother was a musician. I was the only grandchild and it was the apple of everybody's eye. And so first until 1939, life was wonderful. And then, and from 19, 1939, when the Germans came to Krakow, where I was born and where we lived, uh, my father immediately realized that that was a place we could not stay. So we walked 200 miles, equivalent like walking from Orlando to Miami. And we walked 200 miles to, uh, to uh, Lvov, which was his ancestral home. We lived there till 1941, when in June of 41, the Germans overran Lvov. 
that two years was, was comfortable, was fine. The subsequent four years were just pure daily survival. We would, um, for example, we would hide in, in, in places like above a theater ceiling and below the roof. There's usually a space. We hid in a, in a factory, a basement, where the, the, there was blood split all, split, spread all over the floor so the dogs couldn't sniff out our presence there. Uh, we lived, we hid, and my mother and I hid in the closet for two and a half years, where the only thing that we had during that two and a half years during, this was occurred in an office. And so next door were people working. And so for eight to 10 hours a day, we would sit in this closet with just a pillow. Each of us would have a pillow in the lap. There was a chamber pot there and these balls string that we used to pay a play cat in a cradle. And that's all we could do. And as I said, that was for two and a half years. Uh, we ate mostly out of garbage cans. And that was the, our primary for food source was potato peelings that were discarded and uh, also discarded um, wheat that they used to make uh, coffee out of, you know, s substitute coffee. And then when they would imagine uh, coffee grinds, so our food source was coffee grinds and potato peelings. So what would your mother be telling you to help you understand that young, that this was something that was grave, that you're quiet and that you're able to hide away from potential persecutors, murderers. I don't think she had to tell me very much because I knew. And I, was, I had actually seen atrocities committed on the street. And I knew, that, I knew that they were trying to find us and to kill us. So she really didn't have to tell me much. She occasionally had to remind me to keep quiet, but apparently she was successful because people in the next office never heard us the entire two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Uh, but no, there was very, there was very low communication because during the time that there were people around, we could not talk. And even the rest of the time, there was always a risk of somebody was in a hallway. So we would only, whenever we did speak, it was in, in, in whispers. And she did teach me my early, early ABCs. Uh, maybe with difficulty I could form words and even lesser mathematics, arithmetic. And the first time I ever saw was a classroom was my fifth grade when I came to the United States. Mm. The mere word Holocaust strikes fear. I mean, if you look at the origin, you look it up and you find that Greek hollow means the whole and katos burnt, mm -hmm. also known in Hebrew as the Shoah, which means the catastrophe. For you, that was real. That was life. When you think back, what types of things do you remember were happening when you say that, that you witnessed some of those atrocities? I saw a woman shot right in front of me. Um, I saw, I don't know, I think I'm blocking some of it, but I think I, I saw some people that. being beaten. Um, and I always knew that um, it was right there. I, I, whether it was people telling me, I'm not sure. But um, we were, I was apprehended twice. One time, and, and you know, when you say about these horrors, can you imagine a rounding up of children only, separating them from their parents, and these children were supposed to be taken to a death camp and then killed. I was the first child taken in that roundup. And the only reason I'm alive today is when my father dared to go into the uh, police station when I was he where I was held and offered the commanding officer um, two ounces of gold and two carats of diamonds, but actually that's what he asked for. And my father went back out, brought it back to jewelry, and uh, walked out with me. Um, the other time that I was apprehended, my mother and I were turned in by two people to the police who suspected that we were Jewish. And uh, we were taken to, <clears throat> to, after being taken to a Gestapo headquarters, uh, they didn't want to have, to have anything to do with us, so they sent us immediately to a place that was called Umschlagplatz. I didn't know what that was, and it was just a railroad station. When we went into that railroad station, 
there were about five or six, maybe seven people there. And I later understood that that was because a train had just left to Treblinka, which is a killing camp. Uh, had I been on that train, I would have been walked right off the, off the train and into the gas chambers and then, of course, cremated. But, when, but thank goodness we missed that train. And then subsequently, for seven days, the trains did not run. Uh, we, uh, we knew that we were, once we were apprehended, that we were in trouble, but we did not know how much trouble we were in. Well, the children, in seven days, they had brought so many people to this railroad station that the children were so dis disruptive that I was taken out of there and sent to an orphanage. And only 30 or 40 years later, when I was, read some books describing the Warsaw Ghetto, did I realize that I was in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, I was just in an orphanage, and I was delighted to be there because I was, for the first time, I was with other children, and I was so used to being alone that it was a it was a grand time to be with other children. It we really didn't even think that much about being hungry because we were always hungry anyway. Um, then my father had hired a trolley car conductor who went into the ghetto, and I remember and got me, and I clearly remember. Uh, that he, we walked to a guard tower and a gate, and the conductor said to the guard, I just one brought my son over to see these Jewish pigs, and I just wanted to see what they look like. And the guard says, oh, that's good. I'm glad he saw them. Go ahead, go home. <laughs> and he and I okay. were, let, were let out of the ghetto. Hmm. And those were the two times that I was apprehended. So that kind of terror was all around us all the time. Mm -hmm. What was the ghetto like, that kind of life? Well, I know this is a probably atypical response, but as I said, for me, it was a moment, it was a time, a brief time, it was only about four weeks, that I didn't have to hide, that I was with other children. So for me, it was wonderful by comparison okay. with what I was accustomed to. For your parents, you say that your mom and your dad at one point may have committed suicide, but you and your brother kept them living for you. No, actually, uh, it, was, it was slightly different. Okay. My, my, my mother, after the war, told me that the only reason why she survived okay. is because she knew that if she would commit suicide, and she seriously considered it, okay. that I had no chance of survival. So effectively, she said, you kept me alive. And I was in my teens when she said that, so... I didn't know that was a guilt trip or what, but whatever it was, <laughs> I wasn't too happy about that. But then your father, too, kept coming to the yeah. rescue. I mean, your family clearly knew, you know, to, to oh, keep, well, my father, keep close and keep you near and, and, and survive. My father had a, a brilliant story. He, uh, he was the most Jewish-looking of all three of us, but he was educated in Vienna and really knew German, um, the, most, the highest form of German. And he was a great actor. And so he could walk in a room and out German anybody. So, but he went to a physician and to a surgeon. And he said, this face is my death warrant because I look too Jewish. And he finally persuaded, after a considerable amount of time, he persuaded his physician to, do, to give him a nose job without any aesthetic, anesthetic, just a half a bottle of vodka. And no nurses or anything. My dad, in fact, was holding the pan, catching the blood that was dripping from his nose. And this physician took the bone out of his nose and did a marvelous, fabulous job because when he got through stitching it all up and all of that work was done on the inside, my father looked very Aryan. And with the way he dealt with his, and the rest of his appearance, he dyed his hair. And so he had blonde hair, a short, pretty <laughs> nose. So he was in business. Wow. And that's how he managed to stay outside. Then a terrible thing happened. The stitches melted. melted. Oh. His nose fell. fell mm -mm. And we thought that was the end of us. But it turned out that after, when it healed, which didn't take a long time at all, when it healed, he looked like an old prize fighter. <laughs> and he didn't look Jewish at all. He looked like a just that an was old, even better. A has-been boxer. Yeah. And he died looking like that. Mm -hmm. 
And so with his... Well, he had been fighting all of his life. I mean, in, in another way, but yeah. With his command of German and that face that was looked like an all beat up boxer, uh, we managed to, he managed to, he could go out, he could function in the community, in short And he bursts. was very resourceful, we can tell by your story. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> You lived your life in, 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 in horror and terror, and survival, as we said at the top of the show, was hour by hour, minute by minute, and it went on every day mm -hmm. from 1931 to 1945 for more than 14 years. You've talked about some of the things that have gone through your mind, but if we could tap a little deeper, what kinds of things go to your mind, You come to mind? You even, you even say that if you were to write a book, it would be, Mommy, I want to live. Yes. That would be the title, yes. Because that's what my mother told me, that that's what kept her alive. And okay. in indirectly kept me alive. Okay. Uh, I can't really, you know, it's hard to remember thoughts. But I do remember there was a sort of a perverse way of wanting to beat Hitler. By staying alive, we were beating Hitler. And every moment that we stayed alive, it was a small victory. Uh, that, I remember clearly, was part of our motivation. Um, my bo brother was born during the war, and he really, there was almost zero chance of him surviving. But somehow, well, the, the way he survived was my mother had no milk. We were all malnourished. And so we would feed him a spoonful of sugar water every half hour. Well, no matter how long my mother tried to, after a while she had to sleep. And so I continued while she was asleep. And my father was off somewhere, so I don't know where. And this went on forever until somebody managed to find a little bit of condensed milk. Now, he was born with less, with less than, weighing less than two pounds. But uh, today he weighs about 260 well, he pounds. He should thank you, because <laughs> you did your due as well, <laughs> a bigger brother. <laughs> I did what had to be done, that's yeah. all. Yeah. When you think of after all of this was over, when World War II was over, what was that like for you at that point, knowing that soon this was going to be behind you? What, and, then, and then it was. What was that like? The war never really ended for me until we came to the United States, which was February of 47. Um, in 1945, my father joined the Polish government and got a very nice job, good position. And everything seemed to be going very well for us. And several, just about three months later, four months later, there was a loud banging in the middle of the night on a door. And, and the authorities grabbed my father. And he, without a trial or anything, was sent to Siberia, which at that moment was pretty much of a death sentence. My mother knew that if the, his only chance was to escape. And, but if he did escape, then they used the family as a hostage. So if he didn't give himself up, we'd be shot in 48 hours. So she went, she sent my brother and I walking towards Palestine. Now we were, I was 10, he was two. I was 11, he was two. And uh, so we walked all the way across Poland, part of Czech Republic, and into southern Austria. And we would have made it to Italy from there, the ships were going. My brother got sick at that time. But each time, each place that we stopped, I changed our name so that if anybody, and I was trying to evade the Russians and the Soviets, and uh, meanwhile, I hid my tracks well enough to my own parents couldn't find us. And so when they were, when my father finally did escape from prison and my mother waited for him and they, they, they went off to, uh, to Paris on uh, diplomatic passports. Once in Paris, they tried to find us, and the only way they could, they could locate us, they, they would look for two children traveling together from Poland towards Trieste, Italy. That's like looking for two needles in a haystack. We were the sixth of 11 pairs that they visited, and they found us that way. Because as far as our names, for that matter of fact, even my gender identity, I could have changed. I would have put on a dress, and now I'm a girl. Mm -hmm. So you have to do the, what you have to do. You do whatever you do to How survive. How did your father escape? I mean, again, he he's know, this heroic he, man, yeah. your father, doing what he does. He never knew. He was he was about five foot six. He escaped about a fort. He scaled about a fourteen foot wall, which is pretty standard for prison walls. He was told he was given a note in prison 
that at a certain hour the guard would not, would not apprehend him. So he had no idea whether that was a trap or not, but he knew that was his only one shot. He scaled the wall and he said, to his dying day, he never knew how he managed to scale that wall because it was just a plain wall. Got over on the other side, looked over his shoulder, saw the guard seeing him, and the guard just turned around and walked off, jumped over the wall again, not knowing how, why he never got hurt on that drop. On the other side, my mother's waiting in the car, and they drove off to the near, nearest railroad station. Till her dying day, my mother never saw the driver of the car. An angel. Well, yeah. And, just, and the, whoever it was that gave him the no to escape, whoever it was that, that drove that car, right. they earned their way in heaven, to heaven. Wow. Once you all got to that point, you were able to make it to the United States. It took us about six months to secure air, traffic, air travel tickets. And we came here, as I said, on February 9th of 47. And that, and by the way, even then, even here, there was some anti-Semitism. But compared to what we experienced before, that was our first bit of normalcy from 1939 on. To come here to this country with forty-two dollars, correct, in your pocket, yes. in your in your parents' pockets. And well, that and, and we also, in order to fill out my official-looking, my dad's official-looking documents, uh, 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 case, uh-huh. suit, uh, uh, briefcase, there was a chamber pot. That was the other thing we brought into this country, <laughs> a chamber pot. Okay. And so, and then my, he had two brothers. One of them had a house in Newburgh, New York, which is 60 miles north of New York City, up the Hudson River. And we moved to that summer home, cottage. We lived there for four and a half, five years, and then we moved to Florida. And really and truly, the first time that I wasn't the other, you know, a foreigner, an immigrant, or something other than normal, was in Miami Beach, Florida. And that was when I was entered, uh, I was in my 10th grade. Okay. Let's talk, a, before we get into how you were able to succeed from thenceforth, here you are. I want to just get back to, to New York, your first coming to the United States and mm-hmm. saying that you witnessed and were once again falling prey to anti-Semitism so here in the United States. Sure. What was that like? You're coming to the land of the free for the most part, but again, during this time, we understand uh, in, the, in the early 50s, 40s, uh, 60s, that sort of thing. What was that like for you, having to come to it, not to the extreme, but still it, it exists? Well, it was, it was unhappily familiar. Uh, and uh, while well, here, the big difference was that nobody was threatened to kill us. Yeah, as a kid, I was threatened to be, uh, I was subject to being beaten up just because I was Jewish. And uh, I was ostracized from some activities just because I was Jewish. But in comparison to what I experienced before, it was so much lesser that you just got it. I guess you were almost prepared it. for this yeah, because this of what you had already been through. I mean, this was like this was cakewalk lesser. compared to that, I Absolutely, guess. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so then you and your brother decided to go on to become attorneys yourselves. Before we get to that, what led up to your, your choice and profession and, and where you are? Well, yeah. my brother always, I think my brother, that was his first choice. For me, it was actually my second profession, my first profession. I was a construction engineer, uh, did that, and always had a yen in the back of my mind that law would be kind of interesting, interesting, intellectually interesting. And when I got into law school, I realized that I could really do things practicing law, that I could defend people, that I could make the system work. And so I saw a much bigger application uh, of law, of the practice of law, than I ever perceived before. And it, when I graduated from law school, I thought I was going to go back to the construction industry. And my, thanks to my former wife, she said, well, you ought to try that for at least a year so that you don't always wonder what it would have been like. 
and it took me, thir the law was my, like my mistress. I just couldn't give it up. It was a 30-year love affair. I loved practicing law. And my last, my last occupation was teaching law to architects, engineers, and construction managers. And dealing with young people who had a normal life was really fun. It was really great. So that was pretty much on, uh, my swan song. And your brother became a, an attorney, too, he fighting is for a, injustice. He is a marvelous lawyer. I am so proud of him. He uh, single-handedly is establishing internationally a tort, uh, which means a personal wrong, of where, if, where he, on behalf of people who have been hurt by, by states like Iran and, 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 and uh, uh, um, I'm blanking a couple of, he sued several countries, Cuba is one of them, um, I think he sued several countries to establish the concept of tort of terrorism and he's gotten huge judgments and the notion is that if these countries have to pay enough money as a result of their nefarious activities then maybe they may be inclined not to do those. And that's what he's doing, and I think he's doing wonderful work. Very good. Alan J. Hall, are you that name now? <laughs> I mean, because your name has changed through the years for obvious reasons. Tell us about that, because that's interesting as well, how it's evolved. Well, I, I guess I'm the only male with a maiden name. I was, <laughs> I was, I was born Adam Janusz Horowitz. Horowitz pronounced here. During the war, we used name after name after name, and we would have false papers and all these names. By sheer happenstance, at the end of the war, our name was Horsky. As a matter of fact, there were times when my biggest problem was trying to remember what my name was, because we would sometimes would change names multiple times in one month. So Horsky was, was our last name, and uh, uh, when we first came to the United States, we were terrified because we thought that they, they being the Russians and the Poles, would insist that we be sent back because our diplomatic passports were not valid when we came here. Well, two years later, we applied for U.S. citizenship, and five years after that, we became U.S. citizens. So the first thing that we did as U.S. citizens to change our name, to, to jettison the, Hall, the um, Horsky name, which was a name that really had no meaning to us. But we were still too frightened to take back our Jewish name of Horowitz. And so I looked in the phone book, and the most common name then that I saw in the little phone book in Miami Beach was Hall. And therefore, I am Hall today. My wife likes to remind me that had I looked that up that name today, my name probably would have been Hernandez. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so she isn't Hall either. <laughs> no, no, no. She's Not gold. Really. <laughs> she's gold, and that's a better name than mine. Yeah, I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Do you ever think of going home? Have you ever gone back to Poland? What? My father would never go back. Okay. He was really he was bitter about what happened after the war. Um, my mother. I finally persuaded my mother that it really was very, very important for the grandchildren to see from which place we were born. Also, my brother had no recollections whatsoever. We went, uh, my mother and 13 of us went to Poland in 1993. And that was a very significant trip. The grandchildren first time saw the place where all these stories were about. And my brother said, and I'm quoting him, he said, I feel that I'm now, uh, that I'm real. He, we actually saw the coal bin where he was born. Okay. And it was in the basement under, found, under enemy, enemy fire. And we went back in 1993, you could still see the bullet holes in the walls around there. We came back to show our grandson the same location. And uh, that was like this year, the whole street, we could not recognize the street anymore. So that's how it changed. And we were hiding, the, the, when we were hiding in the closet, it was two floors below the Nazi headquarters. And the, the whole idea was that they, where is the one place they're not going to look? They're not right going to look in their, their own nose. headquarters. Right. That's right. Exactly. 
So, and of course it worked because we survived. Um, that building was the tallest building in Poland. Today, it's, it's just one of the smaller buildings around there, in that area. So things have really changed. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, with you being here now, you have so much that you're grateful for to the United States. You've talked about the opportunities that you've had since you've been here. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. I think this country is by far, by far, the finest place in the world. There's nothing that comes even close to it. We travel most of the world. Um, here, even if you're underprivileged, and even today there's anti-Semitism, even if you're underprivileged, there are still opportunities, and if you work harder to overcome those disabilities, you can exceed, succeed. Even if those disabilities are physical, certainly if they are socio social, uh, you can succeed, you can overcome, you can bypass these obstacles. This is the only country I know where you can do this. Um, the, my, I, we, my brother and I went to a public university and we were very, very grateful. I, we all went to University of Florida. We're very grateful, got great educations. We have succeeded very well. We've lived a very good life uh, and I attribute that to our educations. Our children went to better universities, went fine elite private schools. And our grandchildren are now going to the very, very finest in the United States. And we're still Jewish. And, and I'm not sure that it could be possible anywhere else. So with all of its flaws, and there are certainly flaws here, this country just, just absolutely eclipses anywhere else for people if they want to make it. How do you feel about the prejudice that you, you still see here in the United States? I think it's lamentable. I think, it's, I think it's, this country is so great. If we could just get over that, we could be so much greater. Um, when I talk with my grandchildren, there's a lot of hope. Many of the, they have not been infected with prejudice like the people before them. So I think there's hope. We've got a ways to go, but I think we're getting there. And you know, we got a black president. Hey, <laughs> how much better does it get, you know? And I mean, that's a clear sign that things are getting better. Would I like for it to happen faster? Sure, but I'm grateful for what's happening. How does it make you feel to know that we are making strides? We've got a long way to go, but like you said. My chest is puffed strides. up. I feel so <laughs> proud. I feel so happy and, and so grateful. When you talk about the traumas of your life and that sort of thing, I don't think, unless you've been through severe trauma, God forbid people go through things that, that, that would be categorized like that, how does one overcome 14 years of the type of trauma and horror that you've lived in surviving and being a survivor of the Holocaust? For me it was 10 or 11, but still, um, I, I think that the way you overcome it is you insist on, over, on, you insist on overcoming it. You don't ever give in. You don't ever give up. Anybody who knows me will tell you it's not a good idea to, to, to try to outwill me in terms of willpower. You just push ahead when there seems to be no road to go. You still push ahead and somehow doors open. Something good things happen. That's, I guess that's my response. You've had family and friends, I mean, a lovely wife, Lori, in supporting you and that sort of thing. You can only imagine what it's like for her in having to, to help you and help you deal with, you know, childhood, even at 78, some of the things that you've been through. I know you can't speak for her, but in a, in a lot of ways, through, through your love for her, you know that she, she has to go through a lot and deal with a lot in helping you as a caregiver Absolutely. sometimes. Without my wife and without my former wife, I'm not sure I could have made it. Uh, and, I'm, and I know I couldn't have made it without my parents. So there are a lot of people to whom I really owe my life and my well-being and my children. I mean, in some ways, there have been some dark moments that, again, you can't, you know, you can't give up, you can't give in because 
because it lets too many other people down. But there is a payback. When I look at my children and I look at my grandchildren and look at the way that this country is progressing, my gosh, it was all worth it. It was, they're doing great and, and I'm grateful that they had the opportunity, that they have the opportunity to do great. And it seems to me things are getting better. When you look at trying to put behind something like your going through the fears of the Holocaust and that thing and surviving, how do you feel about those who persecuted, who ah. starved and beat and, and, and murdered, you know, loved ones and friends and people you didn't even know by the millions? Well, it's a lot more personal than by the millions. Certainly by the millions. Clearly, you're right. But uh, that, for example, on my mother's side, there's not a single person alive, not one, out of an entire family. Um, on my father's side, there were losses also, not as severe. Well, that's interesting. I think when younger people, when I speak to younger groups, oftentimes I'm asked, how do I feel about Germans? My response is, I feel just fine about Germans. I have no problem with them whatsoever. The people who were the wrongdoers, today would be 100 years old, 99 years old, you know, very, very old, they're probably dead. I don't have the time to waste my time thinking about them. I certainly do not blame the Germans who were alive today for what happened then. I was just like somebody gets killed on the street and you pick up somebody else on the street and you blame them for it. That just makes no sense. These people that are there now in Germany are in no way subject to the blame for what happened before them. They had nothing to do with it. So. The people who did those horrible things to, to me and to other Jews, no, I don't like them, but they're all dead. So I'm not going to waste my time. I was getting ready to, to say, it. I mean, to the Adolf Hitler, you know, dictatorship ruling of German and Germany and all of this sort of thing that's behind, you know, your time then surviving was a... I won. Na, 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 back to them, you know. <laughs> well, I won. Yeah, you won. And my mother and my brother and... And my dad, we won, and that's the key. And just living was the, was the ultimate victory. You are an inspiration. Again, we're, we're happy to have you here on The Aware. Alan J. Hall, Holocaust survivor. I mean, Alan, in thinking about that and you coming and you sharing your story and that sort of thing, you're having to go back and remember things that so often trauma survivors try to forget. I mean, we, we, we hate on one hand that we're asking you to go back and remember and tell us your story, but then on the other hand, your story helps us to understand that kind of hate so that maybe, and hopefully it'll never be, well, you know, repeated. I think the story needs to be told because I think human beings show an ability and it's an uncanny ability to try to kill each other and hurt each other. And I think there are bad people everywhere in the world, and it's our obligation to try to keep the genie in a bottle. So, when I, particularly when I speak to young people, my gosh, people, we have to be aware every day of all of our lives, of each one of our lives, that we gotta be very careful in our political process. We have to be very careful to make sure the bad guys don't get con in control, because remember, Hitler was elected to a power, to the leadership that, that, he was, that was given to him. So he came into, into power lawfully. And we have to be careful in this country, as in every other country, to make sure that the bad people are kept out. And I was, they're here. They're everywhere. And that, that's one of the reasons I tell the story. I think people need to be educated more. And sensitized. And, you know, and even what you just said even speaks of people just getting out and voting. Absolutely. You know, so you speak to so many different things. Um, and being an attorney and having the opportunity to speak to people and things like that, and, and, and I know it's, it's tough having to relive it, but what are you hoping that people walk away with at the end of the day, Alan? That they're aware of their own risks. Thank you. 
thus the aware show. <laughs> no, but I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But yeah, you're well, hoping they, that they are, they walk away aware of their own risk. Right. That's the only. Re what's the what's the reason? What's the sense of talking about a Holocaust? Now is what we learn history in order to prevent it from happening. The horrible histories. That was a horrible history. Hopefully, it'll never happen. Of course, through sad experiences, we know that in some places in the world, it's happened again and again and again. Let's hope it does not happen here and wherever we have an influence that it doesn't happen there. What do you tell your grandchildren and what do you hope the generations to come from your own family will take from your personal experience with this? Never to take our freedoms, never to take our lifestyle for granted. Always be aware, always be ready to defend it. You have not written your book yet, and I know that some of that has to do with not really wanting to dig that deep and right. trying to forget. That's good. Where are we gonna see you if we, if we can't get you now? I mean, and you don't tell your story, you don't put it in writing. Well, then. if I had somebody like you to help me, <laughs> I'd write the book for tomorrow morning. <laughs> we, we need you to write the book. <laughs> now we know Thank the title you. of it, and you're going to have to put the, put, put the story there with the rest of it. I have bits and pieces of it, and I've got to just pull it together. You, you're a retired attorney, mm -hmm. um, and um, I guess you're retired pretty much from teaching uh, yes, on a full-time yes, basis exactly. at least. You're spending some time now going out and speaking now. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, the joy that comes with that now. I really like to speak most of all to young people. Because one of the things that young people don't seem to understand often is that it does to take a, a child who's 13 or 14. In five years, they're going to vote. In 10 years later, they're going to be one of, become one of our leaders, perhaps a junior leader, but leader nonetheless. And in 15 years from now, they will become a real legitimate leader in this country. And it is trying to wake them up to their responsibilities to themselves and to everybody around them. And that, you know, that, that's where I... Now, is we can't avoid the Holocaust that has been. It is history. It's there. But we sure can protect and preserve our freedom. That's what I hope to accomplish. Your personal struggle with this, what is that like? You, I know you're try, you try to put it behind you, and I know now you try to give back by, by bringing it forward. What is your personal struggle with all of this now, and how are you able to really overcome this? Well, I, I approach it in two ways. First of all, I try to avoid. <laughs> it's, it's a natural human instinct. Yes. And there are sometimes when it kind of comes down on me and, and the people around me come to help my wife particularly. Um, and then I try to make something positive out of negative. If I have a nightmare, I try to think of, and I still do have them, why, what, what happened, and then maybe I try to address the issue that stimulated my having a nightmare. Uh, if I fear, I try to address that. I try to work and make the community I'm in a little better in any way I can contribute. And so am I going to do some, have some monumental accomplishment? Probably not. But on the other hand, if I can reach enough people and do little bitty things here and there, that'd be enough. That's worth it. So you do have nightmares. You oh, have sure. flashbacks. Do you have other psychological I issues? have what's commonly referred to as free-floating fear. Okay. Now, that's my terminology. I mean, sometimes I will sit somewhere and all of a sudden I feel uncomfortable. I'm apprehensive and there's really no reason for it. I'm still very much aware when a uniform walks in. Mm -hmm. um, even though I know I have nothing to fear, but it's a uniform. You know, so there are, no, I don't have flashbacks, but, but uh, I don't drink a whole lot because under the influence of alcohol, somehow things go badly for me. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, there are some re there is some residue, but but I can live. You know, obviously, I'm 78. So yeah, I'm you're, okay. you've been able to overcome. Yeah. In you're talking about it, and and you seem like you're you're okay. Have I you know. had an opportunity to meet any other survivors? 
Yes, I've met a lot of survivors, and survivors are just as different as, as, as people in general are. Some are just very much focused on it, and, and that seems to be the, the center of their life. Um, others care not to speak about it at all. I speak when there's an opportunity, and there is some camaraderie amongst survivors. But, uh, you know, we differ. We're, we're all different people. We come from different countries. Uh, we come with different backgrounds, different ages. Uh, probably I am one of the youngest survivors with a memory. Um, there are very few people who have a memory of the Holocaust that, let's say, less than 75. I think 75 would be the youngest. I'm 78. Have they shared any stories with oh, you yes. that were... Can you, can you recall any that would be... There's one in my family that I, that's my favorite. Actually, it's my son-in-law's family. This woman was, was born and raised and lived in Germany. And they knew they should have gotten out. They knew it wasn't safe, but, but they lived in a little village of 200 people. And they, it was a very comfortable life. Well, in 1938, Kristallnacht occurred. And, oh, and by the way, when the Nuremberg Laws were passed, they, uh, their neighbors said, no, we know you're, 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 that you're not supposed to be in school, but you're, even though you're Jewish, it's okay. You've been part of this community all along. You just continue going to school, and we're going to ignore these laws. And over and over again, that happened. Finally, Kristallnacht Christ occurred, which, by the way, was uh, the 75th anniversary was yesterday. And the Nazi leader in that area said, well, you've got to destroy the Jewish synagogue and, and knock out all the windows in the Jewish stores, etc." And the people in our community said, no, no, these are people, these are our friends, these are our neighbors. We're not going to do that. That's not who we are. So the only way he could accomplish that is to bring some goons from neighborhood communities, and they did the dirty deeds. And as soon as they were finished, the people in that community took this woman and her family in, and they, they were nice to them. You know, they, they gave them shelter and food and what have you and, until they got back on their feet. Well, in 1941, it was absolutely clear that they had to get out. And in those days, there were two obstacles. First of all, they had to get a foreign visa. Uh, well, this woman's brother, my actually the father of my son-in-law got out and he was in the United States. So he was going to sponsor her. So there was not a problem getting a U.S. visa. But they couldn't get out of Germany. So they required an exit visa from Germany. And they went from one office to another and they got turned away and turned away because by that time the door was slammed shut. They chanced upon an office in Hamburg, Germany. And in that office, when the head of that office was told why they were there, this was a, a young woman and her mother and father. He immediately started yelling and calling them and being really abusive to them and did everything short of striking them, calling them pigs and all kinds of other names. And so he finally yelled at them to come, in his, come into his office and, and was screaming at them for, for an extended period of time and then finally said to his assistant, give these give these Jews their exit visa and get them out of here. Let them not stink up Germany. Let's clean, cleanse Germany off these Jewish pigs. pigs. Well, they were, they were surprised. I mean, they were coward and they were frightened, but they were getting their visa. So that was, they were surprised and they were somewhat reassured, somewhat relieved, still very much apprehensive about this, this, this man. And as they were walking out the door, he whispered to them, Please take me with you. So it was not easy for anybody in those days. Have you had the opportunity to visit a Holocaust museum? Oh, the indeed. Holocaust museum. A number of them. That's where I speak mostly, in a Holocaust memorial in Miami Beach. Mm -hmm. And we were just recently in the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles. And of course, the story is always sad, and it's always, it's not a not a fun place to go to, but it's a place that needs to be seen. And there, uh, 
there was a great deal more there about, remember, it's not just the six million Jews, but there was, you know, they're now the common number is 11 million. I really think it's a lot more than 11 million because I know there is because, for example, there are 20 million Russians, non-combatants, that were killed. Um, one of the things that people don't realize is, you know, once something like that gets going, there's no way of stopping it. And what, what the number that is not often mentioned is in, is in Poland alone, there were three million Jews killed, but there were three million Christians killed. So once this kind of despotism gets a free hand, everybody's at risk. You know, the gays were, they were killed. The educated professors, professors and teachers were killed. The... Uh, uh, forget the communists, clearly they were killed. The, anybody who had physical defect was killed. Anybody who had a mental defect was killed. Um, I think, uh, the, not the Unitarians, the Seventh-day Adventists were killed. There was, I mean, the, the, it, it was just n no end of the people that were at risk. And there was a saying, and I'm sure I'm not saying it accurately, but if I do not oppose them taking you who will support me when they come for me? I'm paraphrasing. What are the points you try to drive home when you're telling your story? Thus, you'll be telling your story here in our area. What are the points that you drive home? Just to beware. Okay. And I, I mean, um, What's the name of this program? This is the Aware Show. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that, did, that worked out well, didn't it? <laughs> I didn't say that for you to say that, but I'm glad you said it. <laughs> Again. And, I, and I know you didn't say that because you didn't know the show that you were on. You just wanted to make sure that people highlighted the awareness of Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Yeah. We are at risk right now. Times are good. We think that we're secure. <coughs> I pray that we're secure but never be comfortable. Always be, be ready to defend from within and without. Thinking about home, Poland, and, and, and that sort of thing, what kinds of things go through your mind now? I know you've had an opportunity to go back because you explained that earlier. What, what goes through your mind about home now? When we took our grandson last summer to Poland, I was really shocked I, I guess I was shocked by, by uh, just, just the progress, but there was one place that, 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 that really my shock focused. Yes, I told you that the building we hit in was now just a lesser building amongst many, but the place that really rattled me was Auschwitz. When we were there in 93, uh, there was... Um, let me back up for a second from Russia. Sure. There's uh, something else that's more important. Plashov was a camp just outside of Krakow. We know, because we were told by people, that my grandparents and my aunt were murdered there. In well, 1993, when we were there, there were still remnants of what the prisoners used. We still found some of the old uh, tin cups and, and, and spoons. There was rubble everywhere. Um, I don't know what it's like today, but then we went to Auschwitz. And in 1993, it was not cleaned up. Today, Auschwitz is kind of like a park, a visitor's park. The plaques clearly say of the horrible things, the horrors that occurred there. But I didn't feel a sense of horror when I walked through it. Good. That, well, well it's both good and go, bad. Okay, what the good and bad of that? The good is, yes, it is now more palatable for more people to see and more accessible. Uh, so that's the good part. And more people, many more people are going there now. The not so good is that there is sort of an artificial mascara, makeup kind of, that it doesn't look so bad. I mean, this was a place that was a human hell on earth. 
you don't see that now. It's just, you know, now it's a place that's more like a monument. Okay. So they're, they're better and worse things. But the, the progress, the development was shocking. Will Alan J. Hall go back, or are you pretty much I have to go back. Going. I've got more grandchildren. <laughs> you can yeah. go see your grandchildren. As long as, those, as, long as daughters <laughs> keep, keep on, on popping back. children, I get, we got to get, okay. each time another one comes up, we have to introduce them. We have to teach them that same lesson. Where will we see you in the next five years? What will you be doing? Well, why don't you ask me the next 25 years? <laughs> <laughs> I want the book written in five. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping you tell me. Ah. I can tell you that the pressure is becoming intense. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, yes, I will hope so. And if need be, worse comes to worse, I'll get somebody to help me write it. Uh, indeed. As far, by the way, were you asked by my family to, to ask me that question? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I feel like your family. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I really do. Um, and where does it, and more importantly, 25 years from now, I plan to still be here over 100, <laughs> and Plus. I would love to see the end of prejudice. Okay. That would be my prayer. And that would be a prayer I hoped would be answered as well. I want to thank you so much for joining us, Alan, and uh, wishing you the best thank you. with uh, hopefully you writing a book and hoping that you continue to tell your story. Thank you. And thank you for being here on The Aware Show. It was an honor to be with you. Well, that's all the time that we have for now for our show. And on behalf of all of us here at AWARE, we thank once again Alan J. Hall for sharing a part of his life that bears witness to a time in history we hope will never be repeated, but we will not forget the Holocaust. This has been an AWARE Profile. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dee Dee Sharp saying until the next time, stay informed and stay AWARE.